This is the Forbes Books Podcast, conversations with remarkable folks who are impacting the world of business and beyond. Hola, I'm Joe Partavilla, and my wife always says I talk too fast and I should slow down and think more. Well, hopefully my guest this week will help me out. Matt Abrahams is a leading expert in communication with decades of experience as an educator, author, podcast host, and coach. He's been a teacher at Stanford University's Graduate School of Business, a popular TED Talker, and author of a couple of books, including his latest, Think Faster, Talk Smarter, How to Speak Successfully When You're Put on the Spot. He also hosts the popular award-winning podcast, Think Fast, Talk Smart. Matt is here to share with us his insights and tips on how to communicate more effectively and confidently in any situation and maybe even help me talk smarter. Hey, Matt, how are you? I'm doing moderately fantastic today. Thank you. Moderately fantastic. I will take it at this hour because I'm in the afternoon, but you're out west in the morning. So I appreciate you being moderately fantastic. And so I want to start with some transparency. When I saw the title of your book, I was like, oh, no, this is another Daniel Kahneman book where I have to like sit and read for like the next six months. Is it Thinking Fast and Slow Part 2? And thankfully, it's not. And not to besmirch the, the great Daniel Kahneman, who is a brilliant writer. Man, that book was just way too hard for me to read. It took me forever. I think it took me like two years to finish that book. So Think Faster, Talk Smarter. It is a quicker read than Thinking Fast and Slow. It is absolutely. It, and, and by the way, I really like that book, Thinking Faster, uh, Thinking Slower. And in fact, I studied in, in school with his partner, uh, Amos Tversky. So I, I have an affection for that book, but it, that is a, a thick academic book. Mine is a practical, tactical book designed to help people communicate better in the moment when they are put on the spot. So it, it's, it's more like a um, applied book than it is a theoretical book. Interesting. And you as an author, professor, a thought leader, as they say, <laughs> when, when you see a, a book like Kahneman's pop, in the mainstream, like you said, it's a text. Like I read it because I do business podcasts. So literally everyone was quoting it. So I'm like, I guess I have to read it. When you see something like that pop, that's really very much a text. It's not like your kind of book that is user friendly. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like you might, you have to go to the, the source a couple of times. Are you surprised <laughs> when books like that pop into the mainstream? I love when books like that pop into the mainstream because they, they've got a lot of useful information. It is not typical, but when it does, it, it really can make a big difference in people's lives. And that book has changed fundamentally some of the things I do in my personal life. I'll give you an example. One of the things I learned from his book was that how things end are much more important than how they begin. So when my family comes back from a vacation, if I'm going to optimize for any part of the vacation, I will optimize for our return trip. You know, the, I might pay a little extra money for legroom on the flight back. I might make sure that when we get home, we, we go out to dinner or have a food come in. Because how you remember the endings of things have a way bigger impact on the whole experience. So I learned that from that book. So I think it's valuable for sure. Yeah, no, like I said, it's a brilliant book. I just felt like it was, a, for a guy like me, kind of a tough, your book a little easier. Not that you're not a dumb guy, but you, you're you writing a little bit more for the masses. And so when you talk about thinking faster, uh, talking smarter, this has been sort of your bag for a couple decades now. So I'm curious. How did you find yourself here? Because I know this is a new version of what you've been talking about, but the, the thread is pretty consistent throughout your career about this idea of being able to just be a better public speaker, be better at communicating with other individuals. So how did you either stumble to this or find this world? Well, so a couple of things happened that led me very personally to this. Uh, when I was a 14-year-old boy, first day of freshman English, Everybody had to stand up and share what they did during their summer. And of course, with my last name, Abrahams, I always went first. So spontaneous speaking is something I've been doing my whole life because I, teachers are lazy. I was a teacher, a high school teacher, so I can say this. You know, you just put people alphabetically, especially at first. So I was always on the spot. This teacher at the end of that first day came to me and said, hey, you're good at this talking thing. You need to go to this speech tournament that's coming up this weekend. Every teacher had to send some student. I think I was closest to the door, so he picked me. So I show up on this Saturday morning, ready to give a speech because I was told to. It was early in the morning. The room is full of people. They're my friends, the girl I liked, the parents of my friends who are judging this thing. And I'm giving a speech on karate because the one thing my English teacher said is do something you're passionate about. And I was then and still am into the martial arts. And I gave a speech on karate and I started it with a karate kick. I was so nervous that morning 
that I forgot to put on my special karate pants. I was in my suit that was way too tight. You know, the flood kind. You could see my white socks. I gave a kick. I ripped my pants from zipper to belt loop. It was in. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I was very exposed in lots of ways. Uh, but it in, at that moment, I became very interested in the impact of anxiety on speaking. And that I literally as a 14 year old boy that fueled the fire for what I do today. And it's something that, that I, I never forget, that, that anxiety looms large and there are things we can do to become better communicators. And I've migrated into this notion of spontaneous speaking, speaking in the moment, answering questions, giving feedback, making small talk, fixing our mistakes. Because if you think about it, those are some of the most nerve wracking situations we find ourselves in, yet we don't have lots of tools for how to navigate them. So you're right. I've been interested in this for a long time and it, it was born out of a, a, just a personal negative experience. Interesting. And when you started like diving into it, I know there's like these silly surveys that come out and I'm sure you've used it. It's like people fear death more than public speaking. And who knows if that's actually, if these are actually true surveys or if they're like family feud things. But <laughs> why do you think people are more afraid of public speaking than death? Well, you know, you've, like you said, you've been doing this for a while. Have you uncovered for why it hits this level where death, <laughs> death is a better option? <laughs> Yes. So those of us who study this, we, we, we fundamentally believe that, that the anxiety that comes from speaking in front of others is part of our biology. It's part of who we are. And it has to do with the risk you take. You know, when our species was evolving, we would hang out in relatively small groups, up to about 150 people would be our tribe, if you will. And your relative status in that group. And when I say status, I don't mean who drives the fanciest car, or who has the most likes on a social post. I mean your status in the group. And it meant access to resources, food, shelter, reproduction. So your status mattered. And if you had low status or something that caused you to lose status, that was a bad thing for you. You could die. You could be, ex uh, you could be excommunicated. It was bad. So speaking up and asserting yourself is a risky endeavor in those circumstances. And we believe that we carry that history with us. So why do we get so nervous? We are afraid of the judgments and evaluations that people are making of what we say. And therefore, we put a lot of pressure on ourselves and we have physiological reactions because of that. So yeah, there's a real ingrained reason that we do it. Now, that doesn't mean we can't learn to manage it. We certainly can, but it's, it's part of who we are. We see it in every culture and we see it develop around the teenage years. When kids uh, enter early teens is when anxiety and communication really spikes. And again, it's across all cultures, which leads us to think it's part of the human condition. Wow. It's funny. A friend of mine, uh, I, I live in Charleston, South Carolina the last few years. Yeah. And he said to me, what people think about you is none of your business, which is such a great mindset to not worry so much about what other people think about you. And that's sort of part of the fear is like people are afraid to be judged, be looked at, to be frowned upon. So being able to clear that, I, I guess that's probably the biggest hurdle, right? The sort of like the, not even just like what you're going to say, because as you know, that's hard enough to come up with something bright and intelligent to say, but first you got to get over the hurdle of like not being so afraid of people judging you, thinking less of you. So right. how do we shift mindsets when it comes to that? Absolutely. And it's a lot about mindset. So uh, I like to say the goal is connection, not perfection. So we fixate a lot on trying to get it right. And I'm here to tell you, after decades of doing this work, there is no right way to communicate. There are better ways and worse ways, but no one right way. And when we force ourselves to fixate on doing it right, we actually reduce the likelihood of doing it well at all. Uh, I start all of my Stanford MBA classes but with this phrase, I say maximize mediocrity. And you would be shocked to see, I mean, my students, their jaws drop. They, 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 I take all oh, the MBAs. Yeah. They, yeah. Well, they've never been told to strive yeah. for mediocrity. But here's the rationale if you just strive to get your communication done, you actually free up cognitive bandwidth to do it really well. When you're constantly judging, evaluating, or worse yet, memorized, so that I'm speaking and I'm comparing what I'm supposed to say to what I'm saying you lose resources. That takes part of your bandwidth. Your brain's like a computer, right? There's only so much CPU processing. If you have lots of apps and windows open, your computer performs less well. Your brain does the same thing. So if I can take that pressure off by lowering the volume, I'm not saying we should never judge what we say. We certainly should. But if we lower the volume on that, it can actually make it easier. So, so 
the first mindset shift I talk about is reduce the goal of being about perfection and make it about connecting, being in the moment, responding to what others are doing and needing. That's what makes for good communication. Interesting. Love that. And I would get you, I want to get your take because you mentioned you, you've taught high school and you've all, all the way up to MBAs. And this current generation of young folks that are going to college currently, I think it's still Gen Z, but Gen Alpha is, is coming along pretty quick. It, there's this, I guess, narrative that kids nowadays don't know how to talk. Uh, they're digital natives. Uh, all they speak is through text and tweets and, and TikTok uh, videos. Do you see that as well? And I know that the MBAs aren't, aren't at that level yet, but you're, you're on the ground. You're, you're seeing these people. Is the narrative false or do you think there is some truth to the fact that the idea of spontaneous conversations are harder for the younger generation now than it was for myself or, or your generation? Harder is harder for me to is hard for me to say. I think different is a better way of framing it. Yeah, absolutely, I think uh, I have young kids. Uh, I have teenagers. I see how they communicate. It is different than I communicated. Uh, they just have opportunities and multiple channels through which to do it. I do feel that they don't have the same quality and types of conversations I am used to having. Does that mean it's wrong or bad? Uh, I don't know. It is definitely different in the workplace. We have up to four generations working. Some of the biggest challenges that result from that is around communication, issues around timeliness of response. Younger folks tend to expect more quick responses. Those of us of my vintage, you know, we like to reflect, we like to think and prioritize. So you can run into some conflict for sure. Could the younger generation get more comfortable having stronger presence? Certainly. But I think there are lots of people of my generation that would benefit from that as well. I think what's important is that we have conversations like this. I, I was just on a call with a leading company that everybody would recognize, and we were talking about this issue that leaders, it is incumbent on them to think about rules and expectations around communication so people get lined up. And I'm not saying just do what you're used to doing. Think about what's best for your whole organization. And maybe it's adopting some of these techniques that younger folks tend to gravitate towards. Maybe it's requiring or requesting things that more of us who are older are used to, but we have to think about it for sure because it causes a tremendous amount of conflict and can lead to things being missed or misinterpreted. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's funny. So I, I wrote a book uh, last year called Good Listen, and, and my strategy for folks to, to help them communicate is to stay curious. Yeah, and I love it. So, so my, my book is, I guess my book is sort of like the comic strip version of your book, but it is all about like maintaining curiosity because uh, I'll get folks who ask me like, I'm introverted. I'm not type A. Uh, I'm, I'm uncomfortable in conversations. And I say, as long as you're curious and you're listening and asking questions, you can engage with just about anyone. I say introverts are the best conversationalists because they don't feel like they have to do all the talking. So if you can break down the curiosity piece when it comes to people thinking faster, talking smarter, like all of these things, because you, to get there, you have to have a curious bone in your body. If not, if you don't care, all you're doing is having inner monologues to the rest of the world and no one really, you're not connecting with anyone. So, you know, let's chat a little bit about curiosity. Well, I, I certainly, uh, you know, I'm talking to the expert on curiosity, so I certainly don't, don't want to weigh in, uh, you know, over what you've said, but I, I totally agree that curiosity is critical. Curiosity does several things. When you are curious, you put the other person or the topic before your own. And we have a lot of research that says if you are audience centric and dealing what's relevant and salient to the people you're communicating with, you will be more engaging to them. They will focus on you more. They will disclose more information. So being curious is a great w approach to your communication. You will learn more and you'll get more enjoyment out of it for sure. Curiosity is also a wonderful engagement technique. You know, one of the challenges we have with virtual communication is, is the other person listening? Do they care? And, and by generating curiosity in people through asking questions or painting scenarios, like, wouldn't it be great if we could do this? And they're like, yeah, that's cool. How would we get there? By generating curiosity, you can engage people more. And, and as you said, when you are curious, you will listen better. You will, you, there will be more nuance. I have a whole chapter in my book about the importance of listening. The more and more I do communication work over all these years, I have come to realize it's not about speaking, it's about listening. And if you're curious, you will dial in better 
Most of us listen just enough to get the gist of what somebody's saying and then we respond right away or we judge and we evaluate. If you're curious, you'll ask follow-up questions. You'll paraphrase. You'll look for validation and fidelity. So I think curiosity is a, is a very important part of being human, let alone communication. And I, I always like to say, and because you'll come to find out, man, I'm, I'm all about oversimplifying. I feel like a lot of relationships, whether it's intimate or it's, it's personal, familiar, I think they fail because one person is no longer curious about the other. Like, I think at the end of the day, I mean, obviously when it comes to divorces, there could be a million other factors, right. but that to me, when you hear about the irreconcilable differences thing, I think it comes down to one of the parties or maybe both just lost curiosity in the other. Like they just didn't care anymore to learn and they, they know all the foibles that they've, they've tapped out essentially. And I always do this to myself too. Like, even though I, I try to be super engaged whenever I have a conversation. And sometimes, as you know, we our minds flow. I will have like a share snap out of it moment when I'm not doing it because I'm self-aware enough to, that I know I'm like, Joe, snap out of it. You're not paying attention. So I think if people can like heighten their self-awareness, heighten their curiosity, it is that to me, those are sort of the basic steps when it comes to connecting with other human beings. I think that's very wise. I think that's wise. And I, and I think we find ourselves most engaged with others when we're curious and they're curious. So I think there's some, some real insight in what you shared. The level of curiosity, I think, waxes and wanes, uh, as do many things in our lives. But, but I think if we can find something to be curious about, I think that's great. Awesome. And the book, let's break down the title a little bit because the first part, Think Faster. That sounds one of those easier said than done kind of uh, phrases. But right. when you write think faster, what, what does that mean? So it, it means two things. Uh, and, it, and it has to do with mindset for sure. We get in our own way when it comes to communication in general, but especially spontaneous communication. So we can actually help ourselves think faster by, by clearing the runway so we can take off better. You know, when we're judging, evaluating, when we're, when we're trying to memorize, all of that gets in the way. And if we can remove some of that and approach our communication more as conversation, more about connection, then all of a sudden we make it much more effective and efficient. So we can actually think faster on our feet in those circumstances. So I see. So if you clear the deck, essentially, yeah. you'll have yeah. more room to process. That's actually absolutely right. I mean, if you're a sprinter and you want to run as fast as you possibly can, running uphill is not the way to do it, right? So, so if you can make it nice and flat and level and have the wind at your back, you're going to be faster. And that's essentially what, what I'm arguing for in terms of the think faster part. And talk smarter. This is yeah. where I have difficulty. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm not talking well, but- about smart in terms of intelligence. I'm talking smart in terms of being concise and clear. You know, many of us, especially in spontaneous communication, we're discovering what we're what we want to say as we're saying it. So we ramble and we we take people on these wanderings as we're trying to figure out what's important to us. It's really important to be structured and concise. You know, my mother has this saying, I know she didn't create it, but I love it. It's tell me the time, don't build me the clock. And when we talk smarter, we are focused. We're giving people the bottom line. It's structured, it's concise, it's clear. So you can Get out of your own way so you can think faster. And by using structure and some prioritization techniques, you can talk smarter. Do you think that happens because people just don't live in a world that reinforces that? And I feel like I'm an advantage more than other folks because I come from a terrestrial radio background where we had Correct. six minutes to, to yeah. tell a story, crack a few jokes, hit the next songs. And I knew I was surrounded by professionals, Hall of Fame broadcasters, and I knew I had to get my thought across really quickly. And I did that over 24 years. So I feel like I'm a little more at an advantage, but most people don't grow up in, the, in that sort of environment. I, I'm one of the psychos in that realm where I was, I had that sort of bubble around me of people like, hey, get to the point, you know, right. uh, don't bore us, get to the course, as they used to say in, in music. So how do people do this with their core network, maybe their friends or family? You know, how do you do it to help other people without being rude? Right. Like in my world, it was okay to be rude, like, hey, hurry up, idiot, come on. But like in, in, in regular times, we don't want to be mean to people. So how do we do that to reinforce not only ourselves, but the people around us? Yeah, so I believe learning communication is about doing communication. So everything I do is very practical and tactical. 
the book has a bunch of what I call try it sections where I, we give advice, I give advice, and then I ask you to go try it, do it this way. And at the end of each chapter, it, it's got a, a part where we ask you to really drill it, build these as habits in your life. So what do you do? If you're an athlete, if you're a musician, you practice, right? So you have to find avenues for practicing. Sometimes it's joining a group like Toastmasters, where you're with like-minded people who are trying to practice. Other times it's at work, finding low stake situations where you, you tell people, hey, I'm going to try to be a little more concise here. Let me know what you think. Sometimes it's just rehearsing on your own. You know, I think generative AI, for good or for bad, can actually be very helpful in our speaking and spontaneous speaking. I make my students, uh, for one assignment they do, uh, where they get q and I say, go to generative AI, like chat GPT, type in the specifics of your topic and ask it to generate reasonable questions and then practice answering those questions. So, it, you know, the irony of my book, there are a couple of things that are ironic is the better you prepare, the better you do spontaneously. And those sound like, opposite. how can you prepare to be spontaneous? But if you're an athlete, you get it. You dribble around cones if you play basketball and soccer. And you do that a lot because when there's a human being in the game that you have to dribble around, they're not going to be standing still like a cone, but the skills you learn will help you get around that opponent. So we have to practice. I love that. And it's so funny you say that because so in my radio studio uh, yeah. back at, at, in New York, my boss held up, put up this little sign. It was like on white paper. It was like 24 point. And I, I mentioned this in the book, three words, preparation, concentration, moderation. And the preparation piece, I feel those three elements can work for anybody, whether you're on radio or, or in real life. But the idea of being prepared for a situation can, can make wonders. So when I coach people to be podcasters, I'm like, hey, listen, write 20 questions before the interview, but don't necessarily use them because those right. questions will somehow, you know, through osmosis, will work themselves into your brain. And then you will do that. And you could do that in normal life. If you're going to a cocktail party or a family gathering, do some research on your cousin or your, or your aunt you haven't seen. Look them up on Facebook. And just having a couple nuggets ready can make these spontaneous conversations not be so spontaneous for you, but spontaneous for the other person. Well, absolutely. You know, what you're really talking about there is pattern recognition. Uh, in the book, I interviewed lots of different people who essentially came to the same conclusion. I interviewed a, a White House press secretary. I interviewed, you know, one of those graphic artists. So you're in a meeting and they're like drawing it out. And, and they, it all came to the same conclusion. What you're looking for is patterns. And if you prepare, then when you see the pattern, you can execute on it much more quickly. And that's exactly what the advice you gave right there is, hey, generate 20 questions. You might not use any of those 20 questions, but you might see patterns in the conversation you're having that invites one of those questions to, to just come to the fore. So absolutely, really important to prepare. And oh, well, I'm going to steal that from you. Pattern recognition will make me sound smarter when I try to there talk you go. smarter. Um, <laughs> One of the things that since the beginning of this conversation and, and you sprinkle in is the the word spontaneous. You talked about your spontaneous yeah. speech when you were a freshman yeah. in high school, the, the, the work you're doing now teaching your students and even in the book. Spontaneous to most, Matt, equals uncomfortable. Yeah. And people just don't like to be uncomfortable. And even though there's now there's Instagram memes, be, be comfortable with the uncomfortable. Yeah, easier said than done. Uh, right. But how... I guess this more. This could be a mindset question too. But how can people get more comfortable with that uncomfortableness? Beyond the practice that we've talked about, you, you just you drill it so it becomes more natural. You know, the I have a methodology in the book. It's six steps. The first four are really about mindset. The last two are about messaging. The very first step in the methodology is managing anxiety. We get very, very nervous in spontaneous situations because we feel like we don't have control. We don't know what's coming. We don't know what the question is. Uh, in small talk, we don't know what the end of the conversation is. So we, we are very nervous. And there are things that we can do to manage that anxiety by focusing on both symptoms and sources that can help reduce that anxiety. And I talk about it in the book. The, the other book I wrote called Speaking Up Without Freaking Out was all about managing anxiety. So we have to think about that first to help us feel more comfortable. The second mindset shift besides this connection versus perfection is to see these circumstances as opportunities, not threats and challenges, to reframe them. So if I'm finishing a presentation or a meeting and I know there's a Q&A after it, most of us get very defensive. It's like, oh, oh, they're going to challenge me. They're going to try to poke holes in my argument. They're going to level objections against me. Instead, I could see that very situation is, is full of opportunity to extend and expand what I've said, 
to better understand where people are on the issue I'm talking about, to find areas of connection and collaboration. And I'm not saying people aren't gunning for us and, and we can have challenging circumstances, but if I reframe it as something that has a benefit to me and the others, it makes it feel better. You know, why not see a Q&A? Why not see a, a spontaneous introduction I have to do of somebody as an opportunity? And that makes me feel more comfortable with it. And now that you're seeing students get back to normal, I, 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 I hate talking about the <laughs> have pandemic. Have students ever been normal? I don't no, know. I, I try, I'm sorry. No, let me rephrase that, Matt. I mean, in terms of uh, normal routines now in this, now that we're further away from the pandemic, and I don't really like talking about the pandemic, but I worry about what those two years have done to this generation of kids that are going to school. Yes. Uh, my dear friends of mine just sent their daughter to college for the first time. And so half her high school career was basically locked up in a room, virtual learning. And yeah. now she's having trouble assimilating with the college lifestyle, living with other kids, people pulling fire alarms at all times of night, people drinking, uh, people hooking yeah. up. And so I wonder how much damage do you think those two years had when it comes to, you know, what, what's the sort of the after effects of that in terms of people communicating with others because of this, this was just sort of like, stop in time. It was sort of like the Avengers blip, like, you know, everything <laughs> stopped and it all of a sudden everything's back to normal. Uh, how, what, what effects do you think that will have, uh, you know, those two years going forward for kids who are trying to get back to living a regular college, you know, teenage adolescent life? So first, I think it is, it has had a very serious impact. I've seen it in my, my house. I had, I had two teenagers, uh, one who went to college in, in similar to what you've just described. I don't think we quite know the answer. It certainly had an impact. It changed certainty. It changed uh, the way in which we feel uh, our, our sense of being an agency. And I think it impacted not just kids, but everybody. I have, you know, I'm an optimist at heart and I have faith that over time people will put this into perspective and learn to move on. That's not to minimize any traumas and difficulties people are having. Those are very, very real. In terms of communication, I hold out hope that in the not so distant future, we will be able to leverage the skills that we had to learn when we were in lockdown and had to rely on mediated communication. And we can leverage those skills to help broaden our communication more globally, to be more open and receptive to others and using technology to help us in our communication. But quite frankly, in the short term, I think people need to be reminded about what's appropriate, what's needed. We have to get away from looking at, you know, dealing with teenagers, it's about getting away from looking at devices, looking people in the eyes, remembering that you have to have some level of uh, connection before you actually get to the point. Uh, those are all important skills that, that some people lost. It, it's some, one of the most critical developmental times where we learn those skills. So I have faith that in the long run, I think things will be better. In the short term, I think we have to spend extra time and extra care on on particularly teenagers uh, and anybody who traditionally would go through an, a big transition during that time, folks graduating college and going into the workforce, folks who got married, you know, any big transition that happened during the, the pandemic, I think communication was negatively affected. One of the positives of the pandemic, if there are any, is the fact that business leaders, CEOs, they were, I guess, given permission to be transparent, to be empathetic. I, I, I yes. think if, if there was a drinking game for the empathy game, every time you read an article about an empathetic leader, we'd all be just like in rehab right now. But <laughs> uh, but what do you think about the leaders going forward in terms of their communication now that they have this sort of uh, agency that, oh, okay, I can be weak and vulnerable. Uh, is that, do you see that lasting longer? Is, is that is that going to be a lasting footprint of this pandemic, that the openness of leaders in, in the business world? When you talked about the silver lining of a pandemic, I thought you were going to say more people listen to podcasts. Um, but, <laughs> oh, it's one too, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Um, so I, I do think that we are more accustomed to and it is more permissible for leaders to share their feelings and their experiences. And I think, you know, as somebody who does what I do, I think authenticity is really important. So I think that is, it's a good thing. My suspicion is as with everything, we have to find the middle ground. I think I think we've we we might be on the extreme fringes of sharing too much. We've seen some leaders recently uh, run into to challenges when they when they share immediately what they're thinking and feeling. 
So I, I, I think we'll correct a little bit, but overall, I think we'll be, we've moved into the new segment of being empathetic. I certainly know at Stanford's Graduate School of Business where I teach, we teach our, we work with our students to help them be more authentic and feel more comfortable sharing and, and helping them understand that it's appropriate and can be very helpful to an organization when you are authentic and you do ha- demonstrate empathy. So I do think this is a trend that will continue. I feel like just with anything new, you have to find where the boundaries are and then you find the middle road there. And, and lastly, I joke that, you know, spontaneous speaking has sort of been sort of your bag for the, the, yeah. for the lot of your life. Um, but as for an entrepreneur listening who maybe wants to be a thought leader in a space and they have a specialty, how do you keep that fresh and going for so long? Like literally, this is all you've done as an adult. Like this whole idea of spontaneous yeah. speaking, public speaking, how have you been able to not only keep it fresh, for an audience that may be interested, but for yourself, like at what point th- does Matt Abrahams wake up like, oh, Jesus, I don't want to talk about public speaking anymore. Like how, how, how does that work for you? Well, so th- I'm going to answer this question in two ways. Um, I, I think in general, what I, I realize that, that what's I've spent my life focused on is new to some people and that excites me and I, and I love helping other people. So that that's part of the motivation. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, martial arts were important to me as a kid, but I've been doing martial arts now for decades. When I received my first black belt, my instructor said, congratulations, you've done very well. Now let's get started. And that was a very pivotal moment for me. I thought I achieved the end and I only achieved the mere beginning. And that attitude and, and perspective drives communication as well. You know, there is so much more to learn. There is so much more that we can do to get better. There are so many things we don't know and could know better. So that's what really inspires me. You know, it, it's it's the journey. It's not the destination. And so for me personally, I find it fascinating. And just in this conversation, you know, I host a podcast and just in this conversation, I've learned from you some things that I want to try in my own style. And that excites me. And so I'm always, it, it goes back to your curiosity. I'm always curious. And that curiosity drives me, even though I'm talking about the same topic, I talk about it differently. So I appreciate the question, and, but it really comes down to passion and, and, and looking for the new newness in it. I love that. His name is Matt Abrahams. His book, Think Faster, Talk Smarter, How to Speak Successfully When You're Put on the Spot is available now. Make sure to check out his podcast and you know, give your podcast some love here. Uh, if for folks who have not come across it on uh, Apple, Google, or Spotify, what's it all about, and uh, wh- what do you offer on it? Well, so you're going to learn that I'm not very creative with names. So the, the podcast is Think Fast, Talk Smart. The book is a derivative of that. Uh, it's all about communication skills. Our episodes are, are bite sized; they're 20 to 30 minutes. We were we were awarded best dog walking podcast because people can walk their dog in the time. And we I interview experts uh, and academics on the. Uh, topics of communication, persuasion, negotiation, creativity, how to be less nervous when you speak. If you are looking to hone your communication skills, Think Fast, Talk Smart can help. Awesome. Matt, thank you so much for the time. Really appreciate it. I appreciate it, Joe. It's been fun. And that will do it for another episode of the Forbes Books Podcast. Don't forget to hit subscribe. That way you'll get new episodes as soon as they're available. And if you have a spare moment, I would greatly appreciate it if you could leave a review, which would help other exceptional entrepreneurs and folks like you discover the show. You can always connect with me on X, LinkedIn, and Instagram at Joe Partavilla. And please don't forget the golden rule and treat others as you want to be treated. Until next time, adios.